Long time ago, tribes from all over the world came together for a gathering. They had a good time. A challenge, actually, to see who could come up with the scariest thing. Some of them brewed potions. Some of them jumped in and out of animal skins. Some of them thought up devices, weapons, and traps. Until finally, there was only one tribe left who hadn't done anything. No one knew where this tribe came from, and all this tribe had was a story. The story this tribe had was a scary tale, full of fear, blood, horror. When the telling was done, the others trembled with fear. You win, they said, but what you just voiced, it's chilling. Hello, and welcome to another episode of ERG Power Talk. I'm your host, Joe Santana. The clip you just heard is from a YouTube video put out by Placard, a European organization that provides a platform for dialogue, knowledge exchange, and collaboration between the climate change adaptation and the disaster risk reduction communities. In the video, they emphasize the power of using stories like the one they just told there to encourage organizations and people to reduce their carbon footprints and take other climate favorable actions. Like many other leaders and leading organizations, Placard recognizes the power of storytelling. In fact, according to American developmental psychologist Dr. Howard Gardner, stories constitute the single most powerful weapon in a leader's arsenal. So why are stories so powerful? Why is it such a powerful tool? And how can you and your ERG community use it to drive culture change. These and more are some of the questions we're going to explore with our special guest today in this episode of ERG Power Talk. But before we introduce our guests, let's take a moment to review our mission and acknowledge our sponsors. This is ERG Power Talk, and I'm your host, Joe Santana. The purpose of ERG Power Talk is to provide a virtual forum for the exchange of great ideas and inspiration for ERG leaders, as well as others interested in supporting ERGs. No more waiting until the next conference and praying that you get the budget to travel to the conference in order to find great ideas and stimulation towards action. Just subscribe and listen at your your convenience. Before we begin, a quick note of thanks to our supporters and sponsors. UL Solutions, CVS Health, Dollar General, Trader Health and Wisconsin Medical College, Hiscox, Mass Mutual, McCormick, Tapestry, Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, MIT Lincoln Laboratory, Elastic, Oshkosh Corporation, Peace Health, Pitney Bowles, Daimler Trucks North America, and Sony Pictures Entertainment. Now, let's go straight to the program. She is a Los Angeles County Commissioner and a seasoned public relations and leadership professional with over 20 years of experience in management expertise in both nonprofit and private sectors. She's also the founder of Sand and Shores Public Relations and Leadership Consulting. Tanya McKenzie, uh, like you said, the founder of Stand in Shores. We are a communications and leadership firm. I am a digital reputation specialist because I understand that your personal brand and how you tell your own story is incredibly powerful in how you get people to know, like, and trust you. So I'm really happy to be here, excited to delve into this subject because I know how important storytelling can be to your business and your personal life. Thank you for joining us today on ERG Power Talk. So let's start off with this. Tell us a little bit about your background and what led you to this current work that you're doing. Well, the structured piece of it would be, I'm from the Bay Area, from San Jose, California. They call that the Silicon Valley now. So you might not even recognize it. Uh, if you're from California, I live in Southern California now, Los Angeles. Um, I went to Cal State Northridge in LA. First, I actually went to Gramlin State University. So anyone that's familiar with the HBCU life, I figured I really wanted to go experience some different culture than California. I wound up coming back, graduating from Northridge and getting into marketing, uh, PR, 
and the nonprofit sector because I always wanted to help people. I am a gun violence survivor. So from an early age, I've always recognized how important it is to be a part of something, right? And that's that's one of the principles of life is people want to be a part of something. So I always wanted to be a part of helping um, the communities that I was in. So I majored in sociology, but my first job was at the YMCA, my first big job. I was the associate executive director, and I have been deep into fundraising and helping people through marketing and storytelling, that would be PR, uh, for the last 20 plus years. Before I move on to talk a little bit more about the storytelling part, which is what we're going to talk about today, can you tell us a little more about the survival of gun violence? Because that sounded like something we didn't want to leave just hanging out there. That sounded pretty powerful. I was actually going to bring that into why storytelling is so important. You know, when I meet people and they, you know, on paper, everything looks good. Everything looks amazing. Oh, she's a commissioner. She's a business owner. She does this. She's been married for 21 years, four kids, same dad. (laughs) No one would ever have suspected that uh, I watched my mother get shot at the age of five and her boyfriend uh, murdered in front of me. We were, we lived in East Palo Alto, California. So for those that are familiar with Stanford University, It's in Palo Alto. East Palo Alto is literally around the corner from there. And it wasn't really acknowledged very much. I think uh, to this day, they've removed that line and now it's all Palo Alto. But there was a point where East Palo Alto was its own entity. And, you know, my mother was someone that was in the streets. She liked street life. And that was it. And I was a young girl. Um, She had things going on in her life that probably shouldn't have been around young people. And it eventually came to a head on one Saturday morning. After it happened, we wound up going to a federal witness protection program. And from there, a homeless shelter. From there, we eventually got our own place. But my mom passed two weeks after I graduated from Cal State Northridge. So looking at life full circle and recognizing that people cannot judge you for what they see on the outside. That's one of those things that storytelling has really been able to uh, bring to fruition for me is recognizing that unless you are one, open to hearing someone's story and two, not assuming that you know what someone's life is like or what their work life is like or what their culture is like, We really have to invest more in the ability to not just tell our own stories, but also be open and listening to others. I agree. And by the way, that is an excellent example of a personal and powerful story that you just gave there. Thank you for sharing that with us. I really appreciate it. So you covered the question of why storytelling is such a powerful tool because you just exemplified it. So my next question is this, if storytelling is so powerful, why is it that so many leaders rely so much on facts and figures? And I mean, anybody who's been in the corporate world has sat through all the boring charts and the PowerPoints. And in theory, these are supposed to convince us and move us and get us all on board. But quite frankly, they don't, right? So We realize that storytelling is powerful. I think intuitively most of us know that, but why do so many leaders just rely on the facts and figures then? Well, let's let's be honest. Most organizations are led by men. So that's one. Two, women are much more emotional and able to balance emotion with those numbers. So let's not get it twisted. The numbers are important, okay? Numbers give us a, a, numbers give us a roadmap to what is successful. But at the same time, I think if there's all adults in this room, we probably know by now that um, emotions have no logic. So numbers are all about logic and fact, but emotion, which is getting people triggered in a way that they will get you to those numbers or even beyond those numbers is the important piece. So I'm a huge advocate of women in leadership. I think they should be at the table because everything is not about the numbers. 
it's a good roadmap, but it's not the end all be all. And the culture is not reflected in numbers. The culture has more to do with emotion and and unity and how you uh, you know trigger action in people. So when we do look at those numbers, they matter in a way that give us guidelines and give us a roadmap, but the stories are what connect us and what connect us as a team, which what connects us to the goal, what connects us to um, a, a unified victory, which is the things that most companies want to celebrate, right? At the end of the day, there's no one person, especially when you're talking about large organizations that made it happen, it's their team. And you can't just steer the team with facts and figures. Many times up until you know recently, the last decade, the only stories that were told were from leadership. But I believe in what I've seen in numbers is building a culture, a strong culture in an organization actually integrates more of the team, the employees, you know, the team members and their stories. I couldn't agree with you more. And by the way, I mean, that the earlier comment that you made about men versus women in terms of storytelling and the fact that it has that emotional content to it, right? That that it needs that emotional content. It's not that men are incapable of having emotional content. It's that from you, you know, and I could say that from my own background to some degree, that we're trained to, to suppress that a little bit, much more than women are. So that becomes a little bit of a barrier that we need to cross. Not everybody. And there are some people that I've known that are excellent storytellers who are men, but by and far, we are a little more contained in terms of our emotions. So I guess going to facts and figures feels like a safe place because it's all about logic and I don't have to tell you anything about myself or make myself vulnerable in any way. Let's talk a little bit about what it takes to be an effective storyteller. Storytelling is a skill. What are some of the components of those skills that people who are listening to this can develop or can explore so that they can become more effective and impactful storytellers? When there's storytelling involved, there's an implied level of trust. I am trusting you. I am trusting this room with something that I'm about to share. Know that you are in a space where someone is leveraging implied trust. So understand that and move accordingly, right? Then we have understanding the moment. So your storytelling should be relevant to the moment that you're in. Okay, we can't be telling stories about something that has nothing to do with anybody in the room or what it is that we're trying to accomplish. So just random storytelling that could probably leave some people a little confused. Also, it's the non-judgmental moment for both sides, the storyteller and those that are listening. When someone is vulnerable and shares a personal story, it is to connect with you, not to be judged by you. So please always keep that in mind. And then most importantly, be authentic and transparent. If you're going to tell a story, be willing to go there. Be willing to take your audience there. Don't just say, I was scared or it was cold. Take them there. How did you get to scared? Walk me through those emotions that led you from your safe place to your place of fear, to your, from your warm place to that place of frigidness, from your happy place to that space where you are incredibly upset or sad. Walk us there. Don't just say, I'm happy, I'm sad. Be transparent and authentic. Don't tell your story in a way that you should be on a soap opera. Tell it the way that you want it conveyed. Be open to being transparent. And since we do have implied trust, trust that they will hear what you are saying. A really hard part about communication is people don't always hear what you say, right? I, I said this, but they heard something else. So be open to questions. 
don't be apprehensive when people don't understand, especially when you're talking about stories that are that have a cultural uh, angle, right? If I'm talking to you about uh, what I experienced down south, you, you might not understand everything I'm saying about fried bologna sandwiches uh, in Mississippi. Ask me about it. You know, let, let's talk about it. Or, you know, when we're on the farm and why you can smell chickens from two miles down the road. That's something most people in California have never experienced. So if I'm going to talk to you about it, I also have to be open to the questions that might come and giving as much detail about the history of, especially if you know it. But all that being said, putting a bow on on the rules of storytelling, just be authentic, be open and walk people through it. You can't expect people to understand where you're coming from, especially when you are trying to create create a space where there's an understanding, you assume they don't understand. So talk to your audience like they don't understand. As I'm listening to you, what I'm hearing is basically the story needs to engage all the senses of the listener. Mm -hmm. You have to put the listener in there with you so that they're experiencing at least some simulation of what you experience. And all of us humans have what neuroscientists call mirror neurons. So the expressions in other people's faces, their voices, the pictures that they paint by what they say, we are very capable of then connecting with that and experiencing that. So that's one thing. The other thing is that authenticity that you're talking about. And just thinking back, some of the stories that I've heard told by various people during the course of my lifetime that were the most impactful were stories that were told by a person who seemed to be experiencing the emotions again that they had when they originally experienced what they're now relating in a story. So that authenticity also comes from being able to connect with your own emotions and your own sense of what it was that you were feeling, elation, pain, because that will convey then through your gestures, facial expressions, vocal tone, and all that. And then I think Ultimately, the bow that I would put around it all, and underscoring this because we mentioned it before, but it's you got to feel it. You got to feel your own story. Your own story has got to be something that moves you in order for you to move others. You absolutely uh, wrapped your arms around that. I appreciate that. I think that's a great model to keep in mind when you're putting together your story is get in touch with things that happen to you that are relevant to the situation. And something that really moves you, that you can convey with the right tone to others and then get them in there. Pull in all five senses as much as you can. Okay, so let's pause here and take stock of what we learned from the first half of our discussion with Tanya. One, mastering storytelling is critical to building our personal and organizational brands and amplifying our influence on others. Two, actively listening to other stories is how we forge deep connections with others, which help us to better understand and collaborate with them across diverse backgrounds. Three, when trying to persuade others, we need to bear in mind that while facts and figures provide the logic behind why we need to address a challenge or seize an opportunity, stories are what ignite emotions and drive people to action. Four, a strong, engaging company or group culture comes from the power of the collective stories of many people at all levels in the organization or group, not just group leaders. The most influential organizations amass their cultural power by collecting and sharing integrated stories from team members at every level. Five, when you want to tell a compelling story, choose relevant topics to the matter at hand. Be open and vulnerable and engage your listeners' senses with rich emotional content. As Tanya likes to say, take them there. And the way to do that is by letting your own emotions show and being authentic and vulnerable. 
And finally, six, when you want to elicit good stories from others in a one-on-one -on -one or group setting, first build trust by sharing your own story and create a safe place, a non-judgmental environment. Make it clear that the purpose of listening to stories is to learn and connect, not to judge the storyteller. In the next segment of our discussion with Tanya, we will take a deeper dive into how you, as an ERG leader, can immediately begin to use the power of storytelling to increase your group's power and influence in your organization. All this and more when we come back, but first, this. I'll see you on the other side. Are you looking for a fast and easy way to collect your company or resource group stories and turn them into a powerful influence tool? Then look no further than Culture HQ. Culture HQ's powerful storytelling platform will help you collect individual stories and turn them into one of your most powerful assets. With Culture HQ, your mission, culture, and values are all put on full display through vivid, moving, authentic stories. Instead of lifeless statements, facts and figures, you'll show others what makes you special in a magnetic and action-inspiring way. For companies, this means increasing your influence in attracting and keeping the best talent. For resource groups, it means bringing your culture change goals to life and increasing the power and punch in your ability to shape your organization's culture and image. So whether you're an HR leader that wants to become a people magnet that attracts and retains the best talent, or a DEI leader that wants to build and project the power of their resource group members to drive a more equitable and inclusive culture, Culture HQ is the tool for you. For a free demo and more information, contact Culture HQ at hello at culturehq.com today. That's hello at sign Culture HQ, one word with no spaces. Dot com. So you started going in the direction talking about communities and how they could tell a story to influence companies or influence culture. So I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot here and ask you, give me an example of how a resource group might use a story to change, let's say, a particular belief in the culture of an organization. And for the sake of this discussion, let's say that it's a woman's network and what they're trying to convey through the story is the need to address some policy or practice in the organization that's not supporting women properly. And you can do that by showing facts and figures and saying most women have this situation that's not supported by this particular policy, but most men are fully supported by this particular the policy. You could do it that way, but show us how you would do it in a story given those conditions. I think I would pick something that just about everyone have experienced. And I'll even take it so far as to get as specific as childbirth, right? I know there's a big uh, fight right now about uh, maternity, paternity time, uh, and things of that nature, right? So if we are looking at an issue and a policy to affect change there, there might be an opportunity to have just some moments of storytelling with each person in the group. And it could come down to one, what it was like the first time you gave birth, or if you've had a pet or your first memory of your parents, you know, what did that feel like? How close are you with your parents? And then talking about what kind of bond it, what kind of things take place in order for parents and child or even parents and pets to create these bonds, because some people just don't understand. They have absolutely no, uh, no point of reference in their mind to why women need all this time for maternity leave, when men can just go back after a couple of days, after he picks her up from the hospital and takes them off, like, we're done. We did this. Why do you need six months? Like, what's that about? <laughs> but what I think happens is you need to, there needs to be a trigger. There always needs to be some type of emotional trigger, especially when someone is so, um, so uh, far away from the thought, from the, from that item. They just don't get it. 
So then there's an opportunity to start sharing different stories. You might even have someone that tells a story about abandonment and what that did to them, because it can't always be the good stories. Let's talk about what happens when you don't have those things. So in that case, you know, looking at even just the maternity, paternity leave situation, I'm welcoming the group to facilitate just a moment of storytelling with the group. Because if you haven't heard how something affects someone, especially if it's an organization, let's say there's a lot of people in this organization that are close. If I hear from you and you and I are friends, work friends, my work husband, if we're friends and I hear you talking about how childhood abandonment or loss of a parent has affected you, or I hear maybe one of my other coworkers talking about how she lost a child, there's so many different things that can be said in these types of groups. So when you have the ERG leading discussions and in a way to support and help make change, if they do it in the right way, it actually brings the group together while still showing how important it is to make that legislative or um, decision in the company. But there has to be some openness to understanding what not doing that looks like, right? There has to be some understanding and opportunity to show the benefits of that. Okay, well, those numbers could also show, you know, what kind of stress level women that don't get maternity leave or extended maternity leave um, have to deal with. And everyone knows by now that a high stress work environment leads to less productivity and profitability. So do we really want to go down this aisle or do we want to take the road with the increased profitability, the increased productivity, the increased um, culture, positive culture, and make the change necessary to ensure that everyone that's a part of this team is in a good place and we can all move forward in the best way to achieve those goals that we have. I'm going to structure this a little bit in a different way so that listeners can see what I see, because what I see you saying, and I think it's really a great approach, is I can collect facts and figures that say that the current benefits that we have in the organization are not adequately covering all the needs that women have in the organization. And of course, I can also have facts and figures about what the adverse effects of that are in terms of productivity, because of stress and all this other stuff. But then once I have that, let's say, for example, I can cover that and like Let's say I have 15 minutes or 20 minutes to make my pitch and I'm an ERG leader and I'm the leader of this of this group. And once I have those facts and figures, I could probably present that in about oh, four or five minutes. It doesn't take a lot to just say, look at these numbers and what they tell us. But then I could take all those stories that I collected and I can relate those stories. Here are some of the things that we heard from some of our members and how it affects them. And if I want to really punch it up, then maybe I'd give two or three minutes of my time to someone I'd bring with me who had a really powerful story and let them tell it from the heart. And I think that there in that little 15 minute block that combines elements of facts and figures about what's going on stories about how people are experiencing the organization and how it's impacting them personally. I think that that is moving. It's powerful. It's got all the elements of persuasiveness that are needed in order to get others to really listen to what you want and to take it seriously. So as you were talking about it, I was thinking about how I would structure using your idea and put it and package it like in a 15 minute, um, presentation or a 15 minute pitch. And that's what I came up with. But any other thoughts on your end in terms of other ways that you could do it? Because I'm thinking of it as here are the facts, here are the stories, and here's an example and use my most powerful story as my example. I had a group that I spoke to. It was a large health company and they, their goal was to have more of their employees uh, during the holidays, do more charitable giving. 
whether it's to their charitable organizations or just anywhere, because there was some facts and figures that showed that those employees, like when your employees are invested in, you know, the wellness of the community and making the world a better place, they're also much more productive and, you know, they're happier and their work environment is much better because everybody's like in touch with their giving side. So those were the facts and figures that they had. They had an ask what they wanted me to get um, task their employees were doing. So we started with stories. I had them start with stories, their first impactful moments that they remember as a child. Some of those stories were really happy. Some of those stories were really sad and dramatic. Like I lost my dog, my grandmother passed. Some was like Disneyland and I got a dog, but they were all very dramatic and impactful. So then I asked them to come, you know, think of an organization that either helps with that or someone, an organization that can continue to um, provide those types of emotions for other young kids. And the company, you you know, it was like a two hour um, event, but at the end, the report that came back was that 98% of the staff had done some charitable giving. Eight of them joined boards, boards of directors, and a couple of them started nonprofits by the time that year had passed. We went back and reported on it. So even though there was, you know, uh, they had they had an ask and there was some facts and figures that went along with it. I don't even think you really can measure the emotional impact that you have when you take stories, when you have a collection of great stories and you have a direction that you're trying to move your staff in. Like I don't, she said they didn't even expect that type of impact for them to make. It was a small thing, like give a hundred dollars, everybody give a hundred dollars so they can feel good about themselves. And the immense amount of leadership that also took place once they all started to process how impactful they can really be and after listening to their other uh, in their other uh, co-workers and the things that they have been through, it was it was unexpected. So you never know when you have a great collection of stories and you facilitate safe spaces where these stories can be told, the impact is immeasurable. You just really never can tell how big um, the movement can get when you facilitate safe spaces and storytelling. I agree completely. As you were talking about this, I'm thinking there are some people listening to this who are saying, this sounds great, but I'm not a good storyteller. I just don't have that skill, talent, or whatever we want to label it as. What are some of the things that you recommend that people do who don't feel comfortable with their own level of storytelling in order to start developing that muscle? Start small. So... You know, start with something quick. Start with something that's not long and drawn out. Start with a small group or even just one person. Tell that story and see how it lands. Because what will happen is they'll continue to ask you questions. So instead of the next time you tell that story, them having to ask the questions, now you include those answers in your storytelling. But I always recommend start small. You know, Introverts and extroverts, they they move differently. So maybe you write it. You write it and, and then you practice speaking it and then see if what you wrote was what you were trying to convey. Many times when you see it and you can realize I left this out or that's not what I don't want. I don't want to talk about that part. There may be elements of the story that you want to leave out. So getting comfortable with your story, talking to yourself. Don't tell nobody I said that. I answer my own questions. We're not supposed to do that. But reading it out loud to yourself and seeing if that felt, how did that feel? And be aware of the emotions that it brings up. Because when you are in front of people, sometimes when you're talking about emotional things that you haven't dealt with on your own, and it might come out at the wrong time. So being able to have dealt with some of the triggering Um, moments in your story that you're going to share. But I would even, 
you know, go so far as to just take inventory about some of the great things that you have accomplished. Take inventory about some of the most impactful things that have happened in your own life, in your work life. What are some of those stories that you think back now and you say, wow, I can't believe I accomplished that. How did you accomplish that? But always start small. Make sure that who you're talking to is someone you feel like has a level of respect for you to at least be open to what you're sharing, right? And again, when people ask you questions, next time you tell the story, in include those pieces and you will have a much higher level of confidence because you'll be like, oh, that's the one thing I left out or that's the one thing I want to leave out because <laughs> I don't want to have to answer that. But start small. If you're not comfortable, just start small, write it out, talk it out with yourself, and then be open to the questions that could come and make sure you include that the next time you tell the story. Great advice. You know, as someone who does a lot of speaking and writing, one of the things that I started doing years ago is collecting stories. And I started noticing more things happening around me that were stories. I mean, stories are they're happening at every moment, everything that you do. And I just started collecting them and putting them into a file. It used to be a physical file. Now it's a file on a computer. And from time to time, when I'm going to go somewhere and speak about a particular topic, I recall little pieces of a story that drives that point home. And then I go back to that file and I pull out that story and then I look at it again and it refreshes my memory a little bit. Same thing when I'm writing. But I think that's a wonderful approach. Start a file of your own stories and refine them. You start out with a story that might take 10 minutes to convey, but over time you realize that you can get to the kernel of it in 90 seconds and still have punch and impact. In fact, even more so as you peel stuff away. So excellent advice. So what are some different vehicles that let's say ERG leaders can use to get their stories out there in a powerful culture changing way? You mentioned that some of the work that you do is in social media. So in many cases, obviously storytelling happens where you, when you're in front of a person or a group of people, but there are other ways of getting stories out there as well. What are some effective ways that you've seen people get stories out using media or using other approaches than standing in a room and talking to a group of people? Well, my favorite is the media because they're always looking for good stories in companies that are doing great work. So, you know, with your HR department, hopefully they know who their employees are, right? Companies want media attention also, but no one's going to do just a story on the company. They want to know about the people behind the company. You might not know that, but that's the truth. If a company does not have a story, no one wants to hear about it. You are a part of that story. So having these regular conversations with your HR people, leadership, knowing some of the things that you're out there in the world doing, some of the hurdles that you've climbed, um, some of your own accomplishments, those come into play because they might find themselves in a situation to be able to use your story to talk about how diverse or how incredible this company is or some of the people that this company supports. So I'm a huge advocate of the media, local media in particular, especially local newspapers and magazines. They want to hear the stories of the people that live in these communities. So share. If you have overcome some incredible obstacles, they really do want to hear that. Uh, you can also start writing editorials and sending letters to editors when things come up in the world that you feel like you want to lean into, lean into them, use your story to show your experience or expertise in why you're writing or talking about this particular issue. So your expertise comes in your experience and sharing your experience means you're sharing your story. Podcasts, are great ways to share your story. Many podcasts, especially smaller podcasters, they just want to hear great stories of some of the incredible things people have done. Dynamic things, anomalies. If that's you, it's for you. And there are opportunities to do that also. Um, if you're a blogger, being able to start blogging about some of the cool things that you've been doing. And guess what? 
you can go back and edit those later. <laughs> if you start remembering <laughs> details um, about, or you just want to refine how you told that story. Those are all some of my very favorite ways uh, to tell your story so that they live. Because at the end of the day, I believe that each of you is a legacy. What you've been able to accomplish, what you have been able to overcome, those are all a part of your legacy. And if we don't know about the stories, we can't share them. Absolutely. So what resources do you recommend, Tanya, that our listeners get a hold of to continue to improve their storytelling effectiveness? What have you seen out there that's really good that they can go out and get their hands on and use to keep building that muscle? I am an avid reader, so I'm always looking for other good storytellers or just reading someone else's true story. YouTube is great these days. So if you, if there's a particular kind of genre of storytelling you want to get into, if you feel like you're funny in, in telling some of your stories with more of a humorous angle, um, YouTube is great. We all go, we've all been to YouTube University. They've graduated many of us <laughs> in different things. But I don't think that there is any shortage of just watching other storytellers, listening to podcasts seeing what resonates for you and then following those people that you're like, I love how she hits that angle. Like Brene Brown, like, hello. I love how she just takes you there. Sometimes it takes a minute. So you might have to have a little patience, but getting to the point, I love her style. I love how she does it. So finding people that you enjoy listening to, um, you, you've enjoyed some of the obstacles that they've been able to hurdle some of the wins that they've been able to get, business people and personalities, you know, stay away from the ones you don't like, obviously, but everybody <laughs> has a different style. You know, everyone has a different style and everyone has a different way of getting to the point. So finding those, I mean, I'll, I'll call them influencers because they influence me. I am a news junkie um, as a communications and leadership professional. So I do have certain people that I watch and I listen and I see how they tell their stories and I see how they trigger emotion from the audience or just how they trigger my emotion. Um, but finding people who you really have enjoyed what they do and continuing to follow their work. Great advice. And that's basically listening, as you said, to stories, but looking at them with a different lens. So when you find a story that you appreciate, maybe you revisit it again and you ask yourself, how did they do that? How did they engage me like that? So you begin to ask questions to see how that was done. What were the elements of that performance, the story they told, the way they told it, how they paced it, and all that other stuff. And you can, as you said, with YouTube, TED Talks, all these different things that are out there, there are different vehicles that are available. So Tanya, my last question to you is, how can our listeners reach you? I am really easy and consistent. Tanya McKenzie PR on all social media platforms for Sand and Shores, S-A-N-D-A-N-D-S-H-O-R-E-S on all social media platforms. Really easy to find, sandandshores.com. I try to make it easy and I love helping people with this process because it can be so therapeutic uh, depending on what it is that you're talking about. Excellent. Well, Tanya, thank you again for being on ERG Power Talk today. Thank you for having me. Okay, so let's look at what we got out of the second segment of our discussion with Tanya. One, resource group leaders who want to have a strong impact on policies and practices that affect their communities can facilitate a storytelling session to collect the stories of their members, which they can use to add a motivating emotional charge to facts and figures when they convey their desire for change to leaders. Two, sharing personal stories within your group can also be used to build a group culture of understanding, support, and cohesion. Three, telling your group's collective stories to others can be used to attract members and allies. Four, in addition to telling your story verbally to others, you can also use articles, blogs, podcasts, and social media to convey your group story to people around you. 
Five, you can easily build your arsenal of stories by intentionally collecting things that are happening to you and your colleagues. Six, as you tell these stories, gauge reaction to them, and that way you can refine them for conciseness and greater impact. And finally, seven, to continue building your storytelling muscles, read stories, watch YouTube and TED Talk videos where people are telling powerful stories. According to Reeves Collins, chair of the Department of Theater at Northwestern University, storytelling is among the oldest forms of communication. Storytelling is the commonality of all human beings in all places, in all times. Stories, unlike cold facts and figures, have the power to transcend time and space. They bring people together. They teach us valuable lessons. They motivate action. Creating a collective story about a group of people creates a new and powerful identity for the group. Stories give meaning and cohesion to the streaming events happening all around us all the time. And with that ability to infuse cohesion, identity, life, and meaning, stories create a power that connects and moves all of us. I invite you to add storytelling to your ERG's arsenal of tools to help you to build and leverage your community to influence the creation of a more equitable and inclusive workplace. Thank you for tuning in to ERG Power Talk. If you enjoyed and got value out of this program, please like us and leave a favorable review at your podcast provider's site. Also, invite others to listen to the show. By the way, contact me if you're looking for an ERG symposium keynote or a leader for your strategy workshop, new chair onboarding, and or ERG bootcamp. I can run these for you either in person or in a virtual setting. Also, for more great ideas and tips for your ERGs, get my books, Supercharge Your ERG's 18 Tips to Power Up Your ERG slash BRG Strategy and the new DEI and ERG Frontier. How you and your efforts can rise and thrive in the new world of constant disruption. Both available on Amazon.com. I'm Joe Santana. Thanks again for tuning in.